Howdy, 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 all you cool cats and kittens. Welcome back to Stardew Valley. I'm not on the farm. I'm in the middle of a rainstorm out by the defunct lemonade stand. Um, How'd you get all the way to the defunct lemonade stand in the middle of a rainstorm, Jared? Uh, uh, well, Berkeley, I decided to do the chores today. And unfortunately, Aww. that meant visiting the museum. Oh, what did you have for the museum? Well, I I didn't have or anything to give them. was just visiting one of the chores. I yeah, visiting to try to give a gift to the guy who sits behind the desk, who I can never give a gift to because I don't see him anywhere else. Hmm. Yeah, he does. He does not receive gifts. So yeah, he he gets to sit in his weird, milady hat and cape, <laughs> in the museum by himself. Incels actually haven't been discovered yet in this world. <laughs> um, they haven't progressed that far as a society. Lucky Stardew Valley. Is that progression? I don't know if we well, can... <laughs> it's not positive. It is forward in time, I think. All right. That's an, that I is an argument. I one data point on how incels appear in a society, but I think that it comes later than earlier. Meg says one week until 1.6. That is very exciting. I Okay, so the first thing that I ever read about the 1.6 Stardew Valley update was that it was going to be mostly new tools for modders, which is exciting and cool, but does not affect me personally since I don't play with mods. Not like on principle or anything. I just haven't. It's just, I just don't play with mods because I haven't installed any mods. Um... But then they decided to put a bunch more things in it, and I keep forgetting about that. I think 1.6, oh yeah, new mod support. Oh wait, and new outfits for wintertime, and a new type of farm, and new holidays in every single season. What? So this will be a this will be a pretty big one. Brickley, you're gonna get stuck in your house so many times now with those I'm new gonna holidays. Get stuck in the house so many times, and new festivals. I don't know the difference between holidays and festivals. Um, Susie Moo asks a very important question that I meant to talk about Jared with before the stream and then didn't have time for reasons that I will say later. Um, but the question is, are we going to restart with the update? Oh. Are we going to start a new farm? That's a really good question. Um, I don't know what the new farm type is, so I'm not tempted to, but... If it's enticing enough, maybe it would be worthwhile just to show it. I've heard it's one where they just leave tools all over the ground. <laughs> no! <laughs> My nemesis. <laughs> Concerned Ape does recommend starting a new save. That is true. Oh, and Megan clarifies that not every single season, two mini festivals and one major festival. Okay. If, if you're someone like me who doesn't know the difference between festivals and uh mini festivals and major festivals then that averages out to almost one new one every season yeah for those of us who definitely know what those are but want to be friendly to others who don't know what is a mini festival <laughs> i think right now every season has one major festival and one mini festival Susie Moo and Meg are going to start a farm together when 1.6 comes out. I am excited for you. Here's what I'm thinking, Jared. Maybe we keep two farms going? We keep this playthrough going as far as we can with no tools and pick another asinine challenge to start a new farm with. No and sleep maybe we challenge. Just do that one. No sleep challenge. That's exactly what I was thinking. We've been yes. talking about it for like over a year now. We have our no sleep farm and our no tools farm. Ooh, I'm getting a cutscene with Shane. Uh, I'm going to skip it since no one can see what I'm looking at. <laughs> where where would I go to find Emily? I need to give her fruit. She is mostly in her house or at the saloon. I think All by right. this time of night on a Saturday, she's at the saloon because she works there. Berkeley, can you call this establishment a saloon if it's not cowboy times? Um, well, maybe it is still cowboy times in this universe. <gasps> what? We don't, 
We haven't seen any like self-sufficient cows. <laughs> So, or self-sufficient boys, so they must be interdependent <laughs> upon each other. Yes, I think that's true. Um, it is in the name of the establishment. Like, I don't think of IHOP as a house, but because house is in the name, it is accurate for me to say I'm going to the house to buy some <laughs> Willy Wonka brand pancakes. Like, every part of that sentence is true and makes sense. It is, yes. I think this is my first Elliot cutscene. I'm a little Ooh. jazzed about it. I love Elliot. Um, Meg says the mini festivals are like the ice fishing one. Susie Moo asks if the flower dance counts as a mini festival. I think so. I think in spring the major festival is the egg hunt and the mini one is the flower dance. Okay, that makes sense to me. It's like a like a smaller celebration. That does it take less time too? I seem to remember the f like after the flower dance, you still have most of the afternoon left. Is that right? Oh, that might be true. Yeah. Um, oh, in no. summer, I think you've got like the luau and the night market. I think those are both in summer. Um. Night market's an interesting one because I think time continues to pass so that you can do the little submarine fishing thing. Berkeley, I have gotten drunk with Elliot. I'm not sure Aww. I'll be able to continue my duties. Ooh. Well, it is 1230, so I think your duty now is go to bed. Dang. I did not get to give my fruit to Emily. Aw. Never mind. That is also your duty. Also, it's making me slow. I might not even get home because of this cutscene. This could be very bad for my future career. I think I've said this on the stream before, but the first time I tried alcohol in real life was also the first time I passed out in this game. <laughs> so the fact that the in-game alcohol might make you pass out is just very true to my lived experience. <laughs> um... Jared, I was so late today. Usually we get on like 30 minutes before the stream and catch up and then also like plan what we're going to talk about. Today yeah. I got on three minutes after we were supposed to start streaming. And it was because I was at dinner with a friend. That part was fun and great. I left with enough time to hop on like five or ten minutes early. But then in Utah, right now as we speak crazy rainstorm it was raining so hard and part of my mind when i'm driving in the rain is like you got to go slow it's raining and the other part's like it's just rain right it's just rain so i was going slower than normal for sure maybe not as slow as i should have been going and then a car in front of me spun out i saw headlights facing me on the freeway it was terrifying that is terrifying um, they were fine they like spun into the shoulder, not like into, into, they like landed between the lane and the median. Um, and I saw another truck pull over to help them and everyone slowed down. But then when we passed another exit, everyone that had already been on the highway was going a reasonable speed because they saw the spin out and everyone that was getting on the highway was going way too fast. <laughs> um, Megan in the chat wants to know I didn't tell her that when I got home because <laughs> um, I was I was late to stream. <laughs> it was three minutes after I was supposed to start streaming. Priorities. And I'm telling you now. <laughs> um, yeah, it was very scary. So then I was going slow the whole way home because of that experience. And uh, that's why I was late. And that's why we were late collectively. Which is so. a pretty good reason to be late. In yeah. all, all things considered, right? Like, oh... I'm late because I was busy trying to be safe and not die. You know, who can be mad at that? Only corporate Great. America. I'm glad I don't have one of those jobs where they get mad at me for being late because someone spun out on the freeway. Um, I do know that jobs like that exist, though. We, we need to work on that as a country. Berkeley. Nick says she deserves on the kiss on the mouth after that experience. Well, I'll, <laughs> I'll take you up on that. <laughs> on stream. Can you... Uh, Schedule some time on my calendar in uh, <laughs> an hour. 
Let's do let's do a Teams meeting. You guys do it, not me. <laughs> don't invite me. You guys do your own Teams meeting. Uh, Berkeley, I don't know if you can see this, but I'm looking at Willie's hat, which I've made fun of a ton of times because it's the worst. The top of it is red. Is that blood? What are you doing, Willie? <laughs> I mean, well, some types of fish have visible blood, right? Oh, yeah, that especially the He's dead ones like that you're going to eat. Cleaning fish. With Is that the hat. word for it? Cleaning? Yeah. Yeah, you like gut okay. it and wash it out. Take out the bones if you're doing the full fillet. Alternatively, it might just be a patch. A red patch. All right. Yeah. It, I mean, the hat definitely looks like it needs some patches, so... Willie's about to Megan show says, me something. <laughs> Megan says Willie would kiss her on the mouth if he came home late. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's fair. I'm sorry. I wasn't thinking. <laughs> ah, crab ambush. What the heck, Willie? Why would you do this to me? Crambush. Are you going to give me a new kind of bait? Because I don't want a new kind of bait. I want to leave the crab room. Gus, why are you taking this so casually? Oh, I guess you have to keep Willie in your good graces so you can buy cheap crab from him. All my homies keep Willie in their good graces so that they can buy cheap crab from him. <laughs> oh, I almost said that right. I only switched one part. <laughs> Berkeley, there's another game I play called Kenshi. And it's basically like a hellscape, a po post-apocalyptic crazy world. But there are sentient, larger-than-human crabs. Ooh. And, and there's a faction called the Crab Raiders. And their whole thing is that they love crabs and they keep them as pets and have like hundreds of them and go around fighting all the other bandits with their crabs. And they're surprisingly <laughs> wholesome. In fact, maybe the only wholesome thing in the whole game. What the do the other raiders. what do the other factions use to defend themselves against crabs? Uh a lot a lot of a lot of slaves um that they've bought from like kidnapping gangs and uh that's pretty much it yeah just human shields basically and it doesn't work by the way <laughs> the crabs get them <laughs> the crabs definitely get them i don't know if you've ever tried to fight a an earth-sized crab those things are pretty tough to fight they're very pinchy so making them human size makes it even harder yeah, that sounds like something I would not enjoy doing. Yeah, well, that's one game I would not want to live in at all. Yeah, I'll say. I, um, I've been reading a book where there's a rat gang, and their whole thing is being absolutely subservient to rats. <laughs> <laughs> Wait. So kind of like the opposite in every in every respect to what you said and they're just normal sized <laughs> rats they're not even like big rats what what uh what book is this berkeley this sounds very familiar but like from my childhood and i'm guessing it's mm. probably not a childhood book this is nevermore by um neil gaiman okay yeah i have not read that i have enjoyed it so far it is um like you know, YA fantasy horror <laughs> um, about this whole like underground society that lives underneath London um, of all the people that have just kind of fallen through the cracks of society and been forgotten. Um, good, great social commentary, great vibes, a little, little upsetting in a few places. Because it's too real or because you hate rats? <laughs> I just despise reading the word rat. It's not even like the images it evokes, it's just the word. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, they're, you know like how old fairy tales can be just very 
dark and gruesome in like subtle understated ways yes um neil gaiman is definitely channeling that in this book i think that that is a underappreciated piece of storytelling myself mm. yeah if you, if you take a step back from a story like peter pan i think peter pan's a good example where it's like this fantastical whimsical world living parallel to the world that we live in but if you think about the implications there are some horrifying ones and if you just make that the point instead of like ignoring it you can make a, <laughs> a very chilling fairy tale or a great D, &D campaign um yes yeah i would say both i'd say those are the circle of venn diagram <laughs> i knew you were about to say that as <laughs> soon as the words left my mouth i was like yeah here it comes <laughs> <laughs> Berk was gonna say that stupid circle Venn diagram thing again. It's better than no, saying rat. Words in your mouth. <laughs> Demetrius, I just want to tell you right now: not everything has to be called a specimen. Sometimes it's okay to say thanks and just leave it at that. <laughs> I love it when in the morning my daughter asks for a gogurt and I bring it to her and she says, open it please, because she doesn't have the dexterity to do it consistently. So I open it and then she takes a bite and says, what an interesting specimen. <laughs> Highlight of my day. For some reason I did not see where that was going and you <laughs> caught me completely off guard. <laughs> I've been practicing my long buildups so that people forget like what I'm going to say before I say it. Yeah. You did good. Should have done that with the circle Venn diagram thing. I mean, you still did pretty good at that, I would say. Thanks. I'm going to I'm going to credit the fact that I knew that was coming to our shoot, man. Almost 20 years of friendship. Oh, I love that for us. Figure out the day so we can celebrate. Oh, yeah. That would probably be really hard. I didn't, I didn't keep good records back then. <laughs> you can't just, like, check your Facebook statuses, huh? Uh -huh. We were tagging each other in posts until, like, ten years after we met. Yep. Meg says, does she for real for say, does she for real say that? No, no, no. Just making fun of Demetrius. One time I gave Charlotte, uh, my daughter, a go-gurt which we call yogurt pouches. And she said, what's in this yogurt pouch? And I said, yogurt. And she said, yogurt? I love yogurt. <laughs> and that legitimately was the highlight of my day that day. That's that's great. You know, that's an example of the extreme gullibility of children. You could have said anything. You probably could have said <laughs> cocaine. You know, like... Uh, yeah, she wouldn't have known what that is. Yep, the, the children's weak mind can't comprehend. Oh, I don't know. It's a sweet moment. I'll stop besmirching it with cocaine jokes. <laughs> Meg says it wouldn't surprise her because she says weird stuff. She does. We've been watching a lot of Barbie movies together recently. Um, our friends found like 12 of them at a yard sale or something and gifted them to us. It was very kind. A wonderful gift. Um, so we've been watching a Barbie movie every day, uh, and two of them use the phrase, get your hands off me. And so now my daughter will say that when we're like carrying her to her room or like <laughs> taking her somewhere she doesn't want to be, get your hands off me. That's excellent. It's going to get us in trouble one day, but until then it's hilarious. I don't think so. I think that's a good workplace skill to have, <laughs> you know, imagine how many things you could simplify by shouting that into the face of whoever's closest to you. Mm, yeah. Berkeley, I too have been reading a YA fiction book, except maybe a little more Y than A. Um, mm. I don't know if you guys have read these or this will bring you back, but I recently started re listening to um, the Children of the Red King series, which if you aren't familiar with the series name i was not the first book is called midnight for charlie bone and it especially the cover art 
is an unapologetic ripoff of Harry Potter. But somehow, and this is a very, very hot take that I'm sure you would disagree with if you've read the books. I like it more than Harry Potter. I think it does a lot of things better, including like genuine friendships with people maybe. And it's not well written all the time. The plot's not subtle. Uh, I don't want to spoil it in case you care about those types of things, but there's a very major plot hook that is being resolved in book five that has been very clear since book one to everybody <laughs> but the main character. <laughs> so I'm not saying it's art. I am saying that I absolutely love it and I recommend it if you're looking for something wholesome and not stressful to listen to. That is wonderful. I, I read the first book when I was part of the target audience. And uh, no shame, I, I love reading YA as an adult. But uh, when I was a YA, I read the first book. Wasn't his power that he would, could like look in photographs and hear what was happening in the photograph? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And he can like travel into them as well. Oh, I didn't know that. I mean, yeah. I didn't make it that far. That's neat. Um, yeah, I was I was surprised even at that age. Like, how, how are we going to keep this relevant? <laughs> That's a pretty <laughs> niche power. That's the neat part. You don't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if Harry can stay relevant with Expel Aramis, then surely Charlie can manage it with hearing photographs and maybe eventually traveling inside them. Depends on if you believe the person that hasn't read the book in 15 years or the one who's currently rereading them. Uh, definitely the former. Everybody knows that I'm an unreliable narrator. All right. Well, now that I'm plugging things and I'm on a roll, I kind of wanted to do a little audio discussion real quick because... Oh, yeah, let's do it. Uh, I care about that. And it makes me happy to talk about it to, to you people. So um, right now I'm talking into this fancy microphone. Uh, but if you're filming content or want to be able to see your computer screen without a big thing in your peripheral vision, um, this gets old pretty fast. So I bought a lapel mic, which is this little tiny thing on my shirt. And um, it's about a third of the cost of this other microphone that I built. Uh, and it's nice and compact. It hooks up to the same interface that I had before. But you should be able to hear, I don't know if you can over the internet, but the, it sounds quite different uh, because mm -hmm. its pickup pattern is all directions at the same time. So it's really great for like filming stuff if you're in a quiet space or like talking to people doing a little interview but if you're smacking away on your keyboard you're going to be able to hear it unfortunately through the microphone um but it kind of i don't know the trade-off of not looking like you have a giant thing hanging next to your head all the time uh it's pretty cool and if you're willing to do a little editing it can go a long way um mm -hmm. But the reason that I got that is I'm putting together kind of a little mobile recording setup and I got this little interface. It's like the same size as my phone. Um, usually these are much bigger. This can record four microphones or instruments at once. And these things are way cheaper than they were when I got into this. Uh, back in the day, a four channel interface would have been like $300. And that's for like one that just sits at home and does nothing. But now, um, you know, 150 bucks for something that's portable, powers off USB-C, you can use it with your phone. It's so cool. So I'm very excited to travel around and record stuff and, and interview people with this setup. I'm hoping that it turns out high quality. Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks for sharing. Um, how are you, uh, sorry, if this was obvious on camera and I just missed it. How are you switching between the microphones? Is it a button you're pressing or something in the software? Yeah, so 
um, I can't show it to you, but it's a software thing. So right now the interface that I'm running through is one of those big desktop interfaces that just sits there. And um, I've got it routed into this fancy compressor that helps me not um, have volume spikes. And so what I can do is I can mute, uh, I can have both mics on at once, which is this, um, or I can switch by muting a channel and then unmuting it and muting the other one. So I don't have to change any hardware, um, just press buttons. Wow, playing, having both at once sounded a lot better than I would have expected. I th would have thought it would be like echoey and um, sound unintentional, <laughs> but is it doing something clever to like melt them? No, um, the only thing I can think of is is like the phase that it's picking up the sound. You can hear it a little bit with my S's and T's, and maybe you can't hear it because of the way that the internet um, audio protocol like compresses audio. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a little bit of phasing in those high frequencies, but there's no echo because uh, there's no latency, right? These are both analog devices, and they're going into the same digital to analog converter. Um, so by the time they make it to your computer, the difference between the time that they were picked up is very small, if not um, non-existent. Uh, Got it. Yeah, so there's no echo. And then I don't I don't have my speakers on. If I did turn my speakers on, you probably would hear an echo. Um, and it might feed back because of this microphone being more sensitive to the room noise around it than this one. Mm, that makes sense. So, yeah, that's how mm. I do it. And, and, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I've never tried recording two different mics like that at the same time over my voice. So I'll have to listen back and see what it sounds like on on the uh, stream because through my headphones it sounds a little strange. Mm. Yeah, I know that um, I've seen and heard of musicians using like multiple mics at the same time to get a very specific blend of sounds. Um, Especially guitar, where like recording from the higher strings is going to sound really different from recording at the bass by where your fingers are plucking, um, and like people will use those differences on purpose. Uh, it just didn't occur to me that that could sound good, just kind of organically. Yeah, um, recording the voice multiple times. I was also thinking of like sometimes you'll see reels on Instagram of. Uh, of um like musicians who will turn themselves into a choir for a song by just like singing one part multiple times and modulating the pitch but I, they might be doing some modulation of the timing as well to make it sound like a full group of people yeah that i would expect that especially if they're going for that proper choir sound um and not just like more digital harmony stuff yeah you probably would duplicate it but on the other hand i mean if you're recording each part separately getting the timing exactly on each take takes a lot of skill or some editing to make it happen mm -hmm. so maybe it's easier to have that organic choir sound than i would think i've never tried that though gotcha okay but barma says the small mic needs some equalization it does I'm glad you know i did not I, did, I don't know the words for that. <laughs> Meg says, please, your pigs, they so hungry. I don't think so. <laughs> I think I fed them all wheat. Do you know what that's about? Uh, I When I started the session, I did not give them any food. So maybe that is showing up somehow. I don't know. Oh, Meg says you were talking all morning and not farming. I have been farming. I don't know what you're talking oh, about. Oh, that's true. I was literally standing there just talking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Haley, you lost your bracelet. Probably uh, Willie stole it. Starting drama. Oh, 
<laughs> Susie and Meg do not like the willy slander. <laughs> my fisherman husband would never. He needs only the sea and my love. And maybe Haley's ring bracelet. A bracelet and in a new hat. Uh, definitely. Hmm. All right. I guess I have to find. Uh, Haley's bracelet. I don't even know how to do that. I probably I'd need my hoe, which I can't use. Um, uh, I think you actually. Oh shoot! I might have this confused with another one. There's some piece of jewelry that you can fish out of the little pond by the spa. Uh, oh, interesting. Meg insists that Willie cares not for bracelets. I don't. Citation needed, you know? Oh, Meg says that it's up by the crab pots. Bracelet is on the sand. Oh, I see sand. it. Thank you. I, I would have walked around forever. Probably. <laughs> this is my first first time having all these friendship cutscenes. When I played by myself, I didn't make friends. Mm. I found your bracelet, but I'm keeping it. <laughs> Finder's fee. Are you hugging me? We're not friends That's like that. Out of character for both of you. I won't forget what you did from here. I walked 15 feet to the right and three feet up and picked up a thing. Well, you're welcome, I guess. Willie, eat more fruit. It's good for you. Also, do you think Willie built the docks and then built the house on the docks? How did he end up with that house? I think he woke up one day in the house. <laughs> he woke he up a asleep. fully formed. <laughs> no, I think he built the house on land, went to sleep, woke up in the morning. The house was in the ocean and he thought, I better quit my job building house foundations and start fishing instead <laughs> because there's no coming back from this. Yeah. And then had to build the docks. <laughs> From the house, he fished enough wood that he could build the docks back to the mainland from his house. Mm -hmm. That's or hardcore. he didn't even care about getting back to the mainland. He was just happy to fish. Gus and Pierre missed his business so much that they built the docks so that he would come spend money at their establishments again. I could see that. Uh, by the way, Berkeley, I forgot about this missing bundle. Um, we need oh, yeah. one wine and we need five ancient fruits, both of which are attainable right now, I think, right? So five ancient fruits for sure. Five gold star ancient fruits we can get, but um, we don't have on hand. Okay. The silver star wine is hard to get. We need to build the basement to our house first. Oh, yes. That's the hardwood. Mm -hmm. Okay. Plans within plans within plans. <laughs> Have I um, griped on the stream about that phrase yet? <laughs> no. I don't know if I can resist. No one cares except me. <laughs> Please do it. I, I was I was making a Dune reference, but I I, I don't even think oh, that's yeah, a real yeah. thing. So. No. Yeah, mine's also about Dune. All right, hit it. I read Dune like four or five years ago, and I was I was not super impressed. I know that is very important historically for the genre. I know it influenced a lot of things, and I'm glad that it was written, and I'm glad so many people love it. I didn't love it, and one of the top three things that I didn't love was how at least five times characters talked about how there were plans within plans within plans, <laughs> and at most, at most, I saw a plan within a plan. Never, ever plans within plans within plans. They kept saying it and kept not delivering. That's all I'm going to say about Dune. Could it be that you're that that you didn't understand how Kwisatz Haderach was playing 4D chess this whole time, and it wasn't completely luck and uh, bravery? I, I can't prove that that's not what happened. <laughs> I I feel like um, you've seen the meme with like the weird art of the brain, and then it like slowly becomes more and more crazy. Mm -hmm. 
That's what I'm imagining right now, except each time there's a new layer of plans, it just says within plans. The first layer is plans, <laughs> and then the next is just within plans all the way down. You could do that with the, you know, the dominoes meme as well, where it's like a small domino and a big domino at the end. <laughs> just oh, plans. <laughs> plans. Uh, we should make these. Put them on the, Instagram. I just want to say this might be the first time that describing a meme over voice chat has ever made somebody laugh. <laughs> I'm sure someone has done it. Oh my gosh, it's midnight. Um, yeah, it's kind of crazy how memes have just like become their whole language and self-referential. Some, uh, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, Meg says Dune is about the dangers of boy moms. Uh, possibly that, except I don't know that um, Mr. Herbert had ever heard that word. I don't know if I've ever heard that word. Can we talk about what that is? Is it a is it a is it a boy who becomes a mom? No, it's you know how some people like kind of make pet ownership their whole personality. Oh, it's like, yes, um, it's like a thing to be an influencer, Instagram mom, but you talk specifically about having a boy way more than you talk about, like having a child and make like lots of weird observations about your child as a boy instead of as a child. And I like come to identify as a mom of a boy more than as a human being or as a mom. Um, yeah, just kind of an internet culture thing that people have started noticing and making fun of, and probably rightly so. I think I think that that actually does hold some water in terms of the 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 Bene Gesserit narrative surrounding um, Paul Atreides. Mm. Yeah, I, I, interesting. Berkeley, look, one of our hardwood saplings turned into a tree, but it doesn't look <gasps> right. ready. Oh, is it? I think that looks ready. Okay. I I'm going to go get... get bomb precursors in the game, ATF, in the game. <laughs> okay, I said I was done talking about Dune. I just wanted to say one more thing about Dune. Half, halfway through the book, the main character becomes omniscient. And then where's the tension after that? How do you have tension with an omniscient protagonist? Yeah. That's, uh... Okay, now I'm done. Did <laughs> did you like the book? Have you read it? I have, have read it. it? I, I... But it, I, again, it's been a long time for me as well. The last time I read it was before the first uh, remake film of the modern age uh, modern being my lifetime I guess would be a way to mm -hmm. define modern um, and I enjoyed it but what I liked about it was the political intrigue of it all I'm a fan of that um, that's one of the things I like about the Red Rising series and one of the things I think the first movie did so well was to show that um So, yeah, I would say the first movie I really liked. If they ever make the Red Rising series into a visual adaptation, I want them to use the same, um, I guess, types of themes and uh, depictions that they did in the first Dune movie. Mm, I thought yeah. that was really 100%. spot on. You agree with that? Yeah, for sure. The second movie, I I went in not having refreshed my knowledge of the books at all. So I was sitting through the movie going, yeah, th that's not accurate. This isn't accurate. What's going on here? And I was wrong about some of the stuff that I thought was inaccurate. Um, it turns out that they paid a little more attention to the books than my memory did. Mm. Um <laughs> So I can't fully say, uh, but I, 
I I walked out of the second movie just feeling like they had not been as true to the feeling of the book, if that makes sense. Um, but I still thought it was interesting. I I would I would watch it again. Um, but as far as Dune as a book goes, it's really hard living in the the a world that has fully accepted sci-fi as a legitimate genre. It's hard to look at Dune and appreciate the importance of it in that sense. Mm. Um, but I, again, I still enjoyed kind of the political intrigue and like how the Harkonnens set up the betrayal and all that. I, spoiler alert, obviously uh, for a 50 year old book. <laughs> I don't know if that was even coherent a uh, summary of how I feel about it, but yeah, that's super fair. When you say that the movie kind of didn't meet what you were hoping for from the tone of the books, are you talking about in terms of like the, the desperation of what the character himself was going through or like the, the world, how Arrakis felt or something else? Uh, what I okay, remember I oh, go ahead. of the book, especially post um, Paul and his mom falling in with the, um, why am I completely blanking on their name right now? The people living out in the desert. The Fremen. Fremen, thank you. Um, there was a lot of emphasis on the cultural differences between Fremen and like Paul's background and there was also in my opinion a lot less tension about whether he was um the Kwisatz Haderach or not like it in the book from what I remembered going into the film it seemed pretty cut and dry so they played a lot on that tension within the Fremen and and I just didn't remember that being part of the book at all. And so I thought it was fascinating uh, and very interesting to look at that and, and to think about, you know, the idea of like, if you think about Paul and the parallels between Paul's experience and the, and, and what, what Christians think about Jesus, it's interesting to imagine um, a world where Jesus didn't know that he, that he was Jesus and, or, or maybe didn't believe it. Right. So th it's an interesting thing to think about from that perspective, but I felt like it was overwrought in the film compared to, to what I remembered of the book. Now, whether that's accurate or not is a different question. I don't, I don't know if it's accurate to the book, but I didn't remember it that way. So it kind of left me going, yeah, what? Yeah, super fair. Um, I haven't read the book as recently as you have, and I haven't seen the second movie yet, but um, from what I remember in the books, it felt like um, Jessica and uh, Zendaya's character, what's her name? Chandri? Oh, that sounds right. Um whatever that character's name is, um, that like they were kind of taking the burden of proving to the other Fremen um, who Paul was. And so Paul wasn't really thinking about that much from what I remember in the book. Like it was tension, but like mostly off screen. Like it just kind of background context for what was going on rather than like an active point of conflict. Yeah. But I could be totally misremembering that. Yeah, no, I... Uh, I I think that that would, I think that that kind of meshes with how I was feeling. I think that makes sense. It definitely was a question, right? That, 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 um, the, the Bene Gesserit or, or whatever role she ended up playing for the Fremen, she had to answer that question for them and, and promote that. But yeah, it wasn't really something that happened on screen in the film or not in the film, in the book. Yeah, they're kind of just like fighting for their lives for 
the last 70% of the book. Yeah. I remember. Just trying to survive. Um, ooh, Susie Move brings up a, an excellent movie adaptation, book to movie adaptation, Ready Player One. Have you seen or read that one, Jared? I have read and seen. Um, mm. Susie Moo, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. I loved the first book. I haven't read the second book because I've heard mixed reviews and I don't want to despoil how I felt about the first book um, mm. because I liked it that much. I thought it was just a masterpiece. I watched the film and I think that they put a lot of effort into trying to preserve the spirit of the book. Um, but I, I don't know. I think my expectations were too high because how can you fit the complexity of a character that has so much internal dialogue into a, you know, two hour film? It's probably impossible. Susie has also now read the second book. Um, she feels like they did a pretty good job book to movie overall. I did not read the book, but I loved the movie. So from an outsider's perspective, definitely uh, been great. From my perspective, the Jedi are evil. <laughs> then you are lost. Um, one thing that I have heard about the adaptation is that they took some of the references and updated them. Like uh, the book was written in the 80s, I think. So used a lot of pop, pop culture from the time, and then when they made the movie, they kind of updated those, which I think is a really cool idea. Can't speak to how accurate that is, but that is what I've heard. That's... Ooh. Uh, Go ahead. I was going to say, I, I, I had not heard that it was written in the 80s. I don't know when it was written, so I'm not I'm not going against that point or trying to disprove it but i just think it's fascinating to think of that because i had always assumed it was written by somebody after the fact who's just picking culturally relevant things mm. uh because when, <laughs> when i read the book i was like yeah that is that's a big thing from the 80s yeah that's a big thing from the 80s wow okay cool and i didn't i didn't really think about the, the overall i don't know I just assumed that somebody went back and cherry picked stuff. But if it was written like that's a that would be amazing. And maybe it is amazing that that the author managed to get so many things right in terms of what people would care about and hold on to. Okay, yeah, now that you say that, I'm wondering if uh I was totally wrong and it was written later just about that era cuz like I yeah, I don't know what pop culture today is going to resonate with people in 20 years. Harambe yeah. Harambe, for sure. <laughs> okay, yeah, Meg says Ready Player One was written in 2011. Jeez, I was way wrong. I should stop talking about stuff I don't know about. Um, this is like when I... Uh, I um, <laughs> um, It just clicked one day that the song Back in the USSR by the Beatles was written when the USSR existed. I had just like <laughs> never clocked that. I thought back meant like back in time in the USSR, not like back east in the USSR. Oh, that is so interesting. Yeah, I mean, I can see how you'd interpret it that way. Meg says she told me that Ready Player One was written in 2011, like a month ago. Oops. I apologize. Look, you just went through a, a, a near-death experience. On yeah, I could have told freeway. you that before I saw those headlights looking at me <laughs> on the wrong side of the freeway. No, I'm just kidding. I um, I have. I don't remember things as often as I should. Maybe you would have remembered if you got a kiss on the mouth before coming on stream. Oh, yeah, that's probably true. Ha cha cha. Ha cha cha. <laughs> Okay, speaking of screen adaptations, I can't remember if I've talked about this, but I'm so excited for the Fallout show. Um, comes out next month. Amazon Prime is making it. Um, it is not based on any particular Fallout video game. Like, it's not going to follow any established plots, but it will take place in the world of the Fallout video games. 
and they released a trailer in the last week or two and they there was a teaser trailer before that and they just all look incredible um maybe a little bloody gory for some people here but i think it's going to be really true to the tone of the sh- games a little bit silly a little bit freaky <laughs> very exciting and i can't wait for it to come out yeah that's a great way to sum up those games it- I don't know if any of you have played the Borderlands games, but I would, if you made Fallout a little bit more serious, um, a lot, actually a lot more serious, that's kind of the vibe. It is very much a shooter, and there's a lot of, like, exploration and treasure stuff to do there, but there's also a lot of, like, social commentary and looking at what happens when you have super powerful corporations kind of given carte blanche to do whatever they want um, in both like a posh established way and like a, um, I don't know, criminal enterprise kind of way. So yeah, I'm curious what kind of story they're going to tell with such a broad, um, scope of themes they could pull from yeah that'd be interesting i'm looking forward to it i'm sure i'll talk about it a ton when it actually comes out all right well it's it's pretty much that time of day uh is there anything that we wanted to show off or say or do before we wrap it up um i don't think so everything's looking kind of the same as it was last time i feel like i'm so close to level 10 foraging i'm level 9 i think that happened last stream and we got a lot of uh um forageables in our greenhouse this stream um so that's great still getting lots of money oh we broke we break a million? <gasps> we, we did. We broke a million. That's exciting. We we're ten percent of the way to that golden clock that we want. Berkeley, um, when we get the golden clock, trash and weeds and stones stop showing up. So we correct. can actually farm outside. Yeah, we can clear out all this junk and uh plant fruit trees or uh crops. That is gonna be a game changer. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and 1.6 is coming out. Play it. I think it is it a week from today, sometime in the next week or two. Yeah, I think I think that's what we said. So yeah, exciting. And we'll I think we'll we'll put together another map and or not another map, another save, and and maybe do a little showcase. Yeah, yeah, maybe not something long running, but at least to, to show what it's like. Awesome. All right, well, um, if you're joining us for the first time, check out the About section of our Twitch page or the description if you're watching this on YouTube. You can find our all of our links, a link to our links, links within links within links. <laughs> Just a link with links. <laughs> Two and, layers. <laughs> and uh, you, can, you can follow our Instagram. You can join us on our Discord where we're talking about all sorts of things. I'm going to do a write-up on one of the albums that was really formative for me in my pursuit of electronic music soon, and I will share the album with the write-up so you can listen along and go, wow, Jared, your taste in music is trash. That <laughs> explains how you write music. That's trash. I don't think anyone's <laughs> ever thought that about your music taste. <laughs> oh. So join our Discord, hang out with us, chat with us, and we will be back Um in two weeks because i'll be on a business trip next week good times Mm, congrats that's exciting yeah all right we will catch you soon bye bye